scriptures to Luke chapter 1, Luke 1, and then we will read this section of scripture extending from verse 26 through verse 56. Luke 1 at verse 26, this familiar word of the Lord. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One, who is to be born, will be called the Son of God." Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those sayings which were told her from the Lord. And then here's the words we look at. Verse 46, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For hence, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask once more on this Lord's Day for your blessing upon your word. You are a God who is pleased to testify in abundant ways of your love for your church through Jesus Christ, a God who is pleased to feed his people by his word and through the working of his spirit. We thank you for Christ, such a good shepherd, to lead us into green pastures. And we pray that he would lead us beside still waters and that he would comfort our souls. In Jesus' name, give us the faith to hear and believe. Amen. Congregation of Christ, as you hear the song of Mary, she, she's exulting in the Lord and the glory of God and what God has done. And, and she's speaking of the one who is holy, right? She says in verse 49, holy is his name. God is utterly different. That's what his holiness is. He is, he is separate. He is, he is God and he is not creation. He alone is God. He's eternal God. He 
He is high and exalted. And God is pleased here to praise his name through Mary. Now back in earlier in the chapter 1 there, Zechariah had received the angel visit of the promise that his wife in her old age would conceive. And he, he had stumbled in unbelief and said, how can I know this? And, and so the angel gave him a sign. It was the sign of a closed mouth. And so God was glorified in Zechariah's silence. Now Mary receives an angel visit and she also asks, how can I know this? Or actually, how can this be? But her question is not one of unbelief, it's the question of faith seeking understanding. How can this be? I haven't known a man. And she believes the word spoken to her. And she runs off to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth testifies that that she is blessed, the things will be fulfilled. How is it the mother of my Lord should visit me? And then Mary responds in this exuberant praise to God. And now God is glorified by the open mouth by this sweet and beautiful song of Mary that has always been a great encouragement to the church of Christ Jesus. And Mary is magnifying the Lord, and she's recognizing that this is all, though Mary has this this unique and wonderful spot in the plan of redemption, she is very clear on the fact this is all about God. All that's happening, all these wonders, the, the Messiah coming to the world, this is about the glory of the holy God. God is doing great things for God. And so she wonders in admiration of the Lord God. I want to think about that tonight, this tone of Mary, her wonderment at what God has done. You could call it astonishment. You can call it a lot of things. Somewhere online, wonderment was defined as odd admiration. Odd admiration. That's a pretty good description, right? Mary is in awe, admiring her holy God, the covenant Lord. And as we look at the song, there's... There's at least three things I think we could, we could see as wonderful. First of all, she magnifies God's wonderful mercy. And then secondly, she magnifies God's wonderful might. And thirdly, she magnifies God's wonderful memory. And so I'd like to look at this text under those three points. And so she begins that her soul magnifies the Lord, her spirit rejoices in God her Savior. And soul and spirit are just synonyms, but she's saying, I am deeply, deeply affected at what the Lord has done. And her first reason is verses 48 and 49, that he's regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. And from now on, all generations are going to call me blessed. This mighty God's done great things for me. Her first reason is the, the free grace of God, the mercy of God that he has regarded, she says, the lowly state of of his servant, or some translations, the the humble state. And she's not talking here about about a spirit of humility. She's talking about her condition. I, Mary, am nothing. I mean, literally, what is she? She's a a teenage girl, a young lady, uh, a Jewish girl from up north somewhere, uh, belonging to a people, a Jewish, a small people, a nothing people in the world, who, who are under the thumb of the Romans. And now God is going to send forth the Christ through my womb who will change the world forever. She's amazed. Who am I? What is this? I'm nothing. I'm nothing in the eyes of the world. And yet it hasn't stopped God from stooping down and to grant me this great privilege. Now, this is the starting point of wonderment, isn't it? It really is. To be able to sing for joy, you have to be one who doesn't think too highly of himself or herself. There, there's no wonderment if you think, I deserve this. Right? To be amazed at grace, you have to say, I, I deserve actually the opposite. I deserve God's wrath and his destruction. If somebody asks you, know, are you a Christian? You say, well, of course I am. I'm just that kind of person. Well, that's not the spirit of wonderment. If somebody asks you if you're a Christian, you say, yes, can you believe it? Me, of all people, God would choose me, that he would give his son for me. That's the spirit of awed admiration. So the starting point of joy is a recognition of our own unworthiness. And sometimes we get too used to God's blessings, then we assume we have a right to them, and then we find when we don't get what we want, we complain against God, we're bitter towards God, and we think he's done unjustly with us. But Mary is 
one who has a proper appreciation for what Mary is. Who am I? What am I? The lowly state of his maidservant. Here she's elevated to this role of having a key place in, in the storyline of redemption. That after all, these, these barren wombs along the way, right? God so often throughout the Old Testament is pleased to grant life to a barren woman to proclaim salvation is of me. It's not, it's not of, of your ability. It's not of anything you are. It's what I give. And now he's going to do it through this, this virgin. And so she extols and exalts in the Lord here. Mary, of course, among all people, would be most appalled at what goes on today in terms of Mariology, the worship of Mary, the praying to Mary, the calling her a, the queen of heaven or a co-mediator with Jesus. Mary, of all people, would be most appalled at that. Mary says, I'm nothing. I'm a sinful young lady. I have no claims to greatness. I have no claim to God. I certainly have nothing by which to save you. Mary's amazed at grace, amazed at God's mercy. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Yes, blessed indeed was she. But she wouldn't want all people to call her a co-mediator or in any way their salvation. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And, and as she voices these words, it's not for her alone, but she says in the verse 50, his mercy is on those who fear him, not just me, but on all those who fear him from generation to generation. The fear of God is to revere him, it's to respect him, it's to honor him, just to be those who tremble at his word and who love him. And all the church is able to join with Mary and say, he's done great things for me. He's looked upon me, I have nothing by which to contribute to make him great, but he came to me in, in the weakness of my flesh. And he saved me. Amazing grace. That's to be the song that's, that's in our hearts. Whereas Lamentation says, Because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. A spoiled child on Christmas morning will not look upon any gift in wonderment. But a child who didn't expect it, didn't expect that his parents would ever buy that, that child might be awed in wonderment. Are we awed tonight at what the Lord has done for us? Are our hearts tuned to sing his grace? Oh Lord, what is this? What are these things you've done for us that you, the Lord of heaven and earth, have given your beloved? So she magnifies the Lord for his wonderful mercy. And we live tonight by mercy, don't we? Christianity is not about doing things. In fact, that's actually why I left out that stanza in that song we just sang and then accidentally put it back in, stanza three, when it talks at the end that we must be as good as Jesus. Well, it depends how you read that, but certainly not the gospel and it's read the wrong way we're not going to be as good as Jesus that's not our hope our hope is that he was good because we weren't and he died for our lack of goodness you see the gospel is all about mercy what we don't deserve that's what God did does for us he hasn't dealt with us according to our sins and that's a reason to extol him but secondly Mary magnifies the name of the Lord because of his wonderful might his wonderful might in verse 51, for he has shown strength with his arm. He's shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. In the eyes of the world, Israel was not much at this point, especially. They claimed that their Lord made the heavens and the earth, but here they were a slave people, sort of, right? They were under the Roman authority. Remember, they had been, they'd been under the Babylonian authority. Then, as we saw this morning, they were under the Persian authority, and now they're under the Roman authority. They're not a free people. They don't look very great. The Romans laugh at them, right? Israel's God is a weak God. And anyone who, who, who would be told that this baby of Mary is the, is the mighty king, I mean, it would provoke laughter among the Romans, right? 
They had a good time hanging him on a cross. The king of the Jews. This is your king, you Jews. Uh, hanging from a Roman cross, bleeding, gasping, dying. Weakness. But Mary knows it for sure that he has shown strength with his arm. It's a mighty God. And he is raising up from the stump of Jesse, from the barren land of Israel, the mighty arm of God is raising up a son of David to rule the world, to save his people. God has acted. Mary gets that. God has acted. This is Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. That's how the church sings. The mighty hand of God is the hand of salvation. We can sing. Even when things look bleak from a human perspective. Even tonight, we can watch the news and, and think, you know, the world's falling apart. And then we just go back to the Word and we realize that our God reigns. His arm is strong. When it looked like there was no life in Judea, when it looked like God's people were finished, when it looked like the line of David would never return, it turns out that the Son of David is the ruler of the world tonight, seated upon the throne. What a mighty hand of God. In his own time, in his own way, God fulfills his word. And so salvation, as, as Jonah said, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's his work from, from beginning to end. It's, it's not our work. It's not our power. It's that God does it. And he does it over the powers that oppose him. And so there's this, as you read verses 51 through 53, there's this tremendous reversal of all expectations. That the proud and the powerful and the mighty are cast down and the weak and the lowly and the hungry are lifted up. That's the way it goes. Now normally power is attracted to power. And you would think that, that God, the powerful God, might come to powerful men because the powerful like to receive recognition and enhancement from the riches and the power of other powerful but God's not like that. He doesn't need any enhancement from, from the powerful of this world. He's God. He's the everlasting God. And he doesn't respect the powerful who reject him. In fact, this kingdom that's coming through the womb of Mary here is not bound to the world's expectations and value system. In the value system of the world... The rich or the good looking or those with political power, they get preferential treatment. And those who are filled with pride think that they deserve a certain spot. And now Mary sings of the fact that the world's going to be turned upside down. And the coming of this son of David, through her womb, the world will be turned upside down. There's this revolutionary principle. Powerful are cast down, the weak are lifted up. And Mary knows, in fact, Mary knows a lot as the song records. If you, you go through her sometime, get out a commentary, and you discover that Mary's, she's, she's quoting and alluding to all kinds of scripture passages. It's a good illustration of the reason we want our children trained up in the word, a good reason to know the Psalms. Because then we know how to pray and exult in the Lord. In fact, this is based in a lot of ways on Hannah's song. Hannah's song. Hannah was tormented, right? By the other wife her husband had because of her barrenness. And then God granted her a son and she sang of the overthrow of the haughty. And the lifting up of the lowly. And, and Mary knows that very well. But Mary also knows about Pharaoh. Proud Pharaoh. Where was he? Bottom of the sea. And, and she knows about the Canaanites, how God rolled over them. And she knows about the Philistines and proud boasting Goliath and what happened to him. And she knows about Sennacherib, who came and said to Jerusalem, your God can't save you. None of the gods, the other peoples have saved them. And then God's angel went out in the middle of the night and killed 185,000 of his troops and saw to it that he himself was struck dead in the temple of his own God. And she knows about Haman, who had gallows set up. To kill Mordecai, but himself was hung on them. 
She knows about Nebuchadnezzar. Is this not the great Babylon I have created? By my might and for my glory? And then he's turned into a beast. We have a God who, who turns upside down the haughty, doesn't he? He just flicks them off their thrones whenever he pleases. Meanwhile, Joseph, sold down into slavery and thrown in a dungeon, is lifted up to become second in command in Egypt. And Moses, chased out of town but comes back as deliverer. And Samuel and David and Esther. What about Esther and Hannah and Daniel put down in a pit, lifted up? God scatters the proud. He puts down the mighty. But he lifts up the hungry and the weak and those who rely on him. It's not about, it's not kind of a social gospel or liberation theology here that rich people are bad and poor people are good. Or or as we have it now with critical race theory, white, males, evil, racists, and a black woman living in sexual morality, good. It's not what the Bible is talking about when it talks about in these terms here. It's talking about spiritual condition. But those who are haughty and oppose the Lord will be hammered, smashed. And those who fall down before the face of God will be lifted up. That's what it's talking about. Our great deliverance is not to be saved, first of all, from poverty or oppression or racism. Our greatest need is to be reconciled to God, the living God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the great reversal that Mary praises God for is not, first of all, about two different social classes trading places, but about two different spiritual classes and how the Lord deals with them. And you see that in Luke chapter 6 when Jesus speaks. And people have all gathered him in Luke 6, and they've, they've come to be healed and to hear him. And then Jesus says in Luke 6 verse 20, as he looks at his disciples, Luke 6 20, blessed Are you poor? For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. He's talking about the poor in spirit, whose whose hearts have been broken by the word of God and sorrow over their sin and are hungry for God and weep now over the brokenness of this world and, and their own sin. And then he says in verse 24, But woe to you who are rich! For you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. This is the kingdom Jesus Christ brings. It doesn't play by the rules of the world, which says we have to bow down to all the rich and haughty. It says that blessing... And life and favor is poured out upon those who will humble themselves before God. The true Israel, people like Mary and Anna and Simeon, who were, who were living in expectation and waiting for the Messiah, were those of humble hearts who said, we need a Savior. They were the lowly of, of heart. And that's what we need to be. Christmas is not a celebration for everyone. For those who oppose the Lord, it's actually the guarantee of their overthrow. It's a strange thing that there are rich and haughty people who are celebrating Christmas when what they're celebrating is the fact that they're about to be flicked off of their thrones and destroyed. The celebration of Christmas is for the humble of heart who will receive this Jesus. 1 Peter 5 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Maybe just a word to the young men, especially. Young men, you know, you're... Your muscles, your strength are your glory in one sense. But I think over the years of talking to a lot of not-so-young men who talk about how cocky they were when they were young men, how they thought they could do it all, or how they wouldn't listen, and they had to learn the hard way. 
Well, we don't have to learn the hard way. By God's grace, we can learn the easy way. By taking to heart the word of Scripture, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. When we're young and we have physical powers and prowess, we think sometimes we can do it. When the Lord wants us to fall on our faces and say, I can't do it. I can't keep myself alive for a second. I can't present righteousness before you. I am nothing. And as we do that, God lifts us up. I think it was Calvin quoting Augustine who said, there are three rules to the Christian life. Three rules to the Christian life. Number one, humility. Number two, humility. Number three, humility. Or as someone else said, a man knows as much about Christianity as he knows about humility. Humility. And if we will acknowledge our sin before the Lord in our neediness, if we'll cry out for mercy, if we'll pray hungry for God, then we will be filled and we will enjoy his blessings. But finally, Mary sings of his wonderful memory. Not just his wonderful mercy, his wonderful might to cast down and lift up, but his wonderful memory. The last two verses, Mary says he's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Mary brings up Abraham. Did Mary know Abraham? Did Mary meet Abraham? The answer, of course, is no. There's as much distance between Abraham and Mary as there is between Mary and us. 2,000 years. And this is what comes to her mind. This is what comes to her mind after she's been told that she's going to have a baby. Abraham? I wonder sometimes how much they knew. How much do those Old Testament saints get it? Well, some of them got it, didn't they? 2,000 years later, and this is the source of Mary's life and confidence that God spoke a word to Abraham. It said that in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed through your line. And now God is keeping his word. It seems like God's promise has been forgotten. Where's Abraham? Where's David? Where's the line of David? Where's the kings? Where's, where's the free people ruling? I mean, this morning we saw this temple being rebuilt. The temple has been rebuilt for 500 years. Where is the glory? Where's the glory? And Mary says he's kept his word. He's kept his word. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. When the fullness of time had come. We have short memories, don't we? We are an impatient people. And God's maidservant Mary has believed a promise some 2,000 years old. And she says the Lord has done all of this in remembrance of the mercy he promised us. God is faithful to the end. J.C. Ryle, writing 150 years ago, wrote, Let us learn from this holy woman's example to lay firm hold on Bible promises. It is of the deepest importance to our peace to do so. Promises are, in fact, the manna that we should eat daily and the water that we should daily drink as we travel through the wilderness of this world. We see not yet all things put under us. We see not Christ and heaven and the book of life and the mansions prepared for us. We walk by faith. And this faith leans on promises. But on those promises we may lean confidently. They will bear all the weight that we can lay on them. We shall find one day, like the Virgin Mary, that God keeps his word. And that what he has spoken, so he will always do 
in due time he will perform. Those are great words. Lean on the promises because those promises will bear all the weight that you can lean on them. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would teach our song, our hearts to sing with Mary, to sing her song and to sing with her wonderment. Oh God, may we admire you in awed admiration that you, the living God, the wondrous God, have done great and extraordinary things. Wonderful is your name. You do what no man can do. You do things that are far beyond all human powers. You show kindnesses that we would never think to show. You have no regard for the haughty, proud hearts. You are not intimidated by them, but you oppose them. You look upon the weak and the weary, and you lift them up, though they have nothing to offer you. You never forget any of your promises. Every word you've spoken is yes and amen through Jesus Christ. Every promise ratified by his blood. Oh God, we pray that you teach us to sing with joy and delight. And that you'd receive our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 301, let's seek to sing this.